Hi everyone, welcome to a new video. Thank you so much for being so patient while we waited for this one. Um, it's actually been a very interesting uh, couple of months. I actually got a new job and I will be moving to a new place very soon. And so a lot of exciting things are happening, but I've also had some time to think about new exciting things that I want to do for this channel. And I have ideas for a lot more of Jane Austen content. So I've been thinking about the reasons why Jane Austen is still so relevant to this day and the reasons why we keep going back to her works even though they are situated in such a specific cultural, political and social context. So why are these works that were written over 200 years ago still so relevant to today's society? And so one of the things that I very much want to do is think about the ways we have reimagined these works in recent years, the different ways in which we are thinking about them. And so one thing that I will be doing uh, will be to review works like these and also to interview the authors who have written them. If this sounds like your kind of thing, then do make sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of my future content. And this is how I came across this book, Back to the Bonnet by Jennifer Duke. I was looking at new books that have been written, uh, reimagining Jane Austen's novels, and I came across this one. It was sent to me by the author, Jennifer Duke, and I am so happy that she did because I think it's an excellent example of the very exciting things that are coming out at the moment inspired by Austen's works. And if you enjoyed this review, then please subscribe to this channel because I will be interviewing Jennifer Duke very soon and you won't want to miss that. So, Back to the Bonnet, to put it very simply, is a book about how Mary Bennet finds a bonnet that allows her to travel in time. And if this doesn't make you want to read it, then I have no idea what will. <laughs> and I thought I would begin with a confession. So Mary Bennett is only not my least favorite Bennett sister because Lydia is there basically making everyone else look good. So my favorite sister is by far Elizabeth and Mary never came across to me as someone who would be particularly interesting to meet in real life. Elizabeth was always the one who caught my attention and never Mary. Mary just always seems to be in the background and like um, secondary characters like Jane or Lydia that actually help push the narrative forward and who are far more central to the story. But in many ways, this is precisely what makes Mary the ideal protagonist for a book like this. Because we get so little of her, we are curious to see more. She never goes beyond this posture. She's like an automaton. She just seems to only be able to parrot the things that she reads, but whether she can actually understand them is a whole other thing. And we don't want to believe that this is all there is to her. We want to believe that there are some hidden depths there. And because she is also this kind of character that no one notices, the one who is always in the background, then she is the perfect person to be quietly observing what everyone else is doing and to subsequently manipulate the events. So she is the perfect protagonist for a book about time travel. And the Mary that Jennifer Duke gives us is both surprising and familiar. So while it's definitely uh, going beyond the Mary that Jane Austen gave us in the original, um, I felt as I was reading it that everything that Mary did was actually really fitting with the original. And this is from the very first page of the novel where Mary is writing a letter where she is explaining that this narrative that she is about to tell is actually all true even though it reads like a novel. And she admits the ironic aspect of the fact that she, someone who hates reading novels, has actually had a really nice time writing something that very much sounds like one and reads like one. So immediately this sounded like something that Mary would say, and I was drawn in from the very beginning. And Jennifer Duke's prose is absolutely beautiful. 
and incredibly funny as well. She gives us this story as told by Mary in a first person perspective and the voice that she has created for Mary is just really, really funny. And again, this is from the very first sentence of the first chapter of the book, which starts like this. The piece was marked fortissimo, and so despite Lydia stamping from her bedroom above, I played as loudly as I could. In this, I served my own purpose as well as fulfilling the wishes of the composer. And this was so vivid for me. I could just imagine Mary just getting really annoyed at Lydia being really loudly upstairs and just reading Fortissimo and just being like, okay then, and just pressing her fingers up against, uh, up against the keys. So immediately I want to know more about this Mary and I want to know more about all the different characters from her perspective. So from Mary's perspective, what is it like to live in Longbourn? But Rita, you mentioned a time traveling bonnet. Can we go back to that? Yes, we can. So how does this come to pass? Well, at the beginning of the book, Mary finds out that an aunt she has, Aunt Ari Harriet, uh, who is a spinster, has recently died and has left them a few objects. So she wasn't wealthy, but she had a few little trinkets to leave them. And so while everyone is fighting for the different objects, they find this bonnet that is really quite ugly, uh, very old fashioned, and so obviously it gets thrown in Mary's direction. If it's something that no one else wants, give it to Mary. And she, you know, can't be bothered fighting over anything else, so she happily takes it. But soon enough, she finds out that this bonnet actually allows her the ability to listen to other people's conversations and to travel in time. And this is how Mary finds out about the different obstacles that she and her sisters face and which she tries to fix by time traveling. And anyone who has read any other Austen novel aside from Pride and Prejudice is going to recognize some pretty familiar characters. There are some, shall we say, less than eligible bachelors who will try to slither their way into the Bennett family and it's Mary's job to prevent them from doing that. And there's actually a scene where Mary scares off one of these not eligible bachelors and it's absolutely hilarious. It's definitely one of my favorite scenes in the whole book. But possibly my absolute favorite thing about this book is that Jennifer Duke resisted the temptation to make Mary a moral person. And why was this so important to me? Usually when we get a book like this, we get a retelling of the original narrative in a way that basically shows us that this character actually did everything right, whereas everyone else did everything wrong. So this is the way that the author usually finds for us to sympathize with this character that we didn't really sympathize with in the original. But this book does something that for me is far more complex and far more interesting. To begin with, Mary is using the bonnet in order to save herself and her sisters from the inevitable reduction of circumstances that they are going to face when their father dies. Or, this is what Mary wants to believe, but in reality what Jennifer Duke shows us is that Mary is doing this for purely selfish reasons. Mary is doing this not because she is some kind of martyr who is willing to sacrifice herself for the love of her family. She's not. She doesn't even seem to particularly love her sisters. For example, she is only too happy to see Elizabeth get humiliated by Darcy at the ball. And while Mary isn't willing to sacrifice herself in marriage in order to secure either her comfort or those of her sisters, she is only too happy at the idea of her sisters doing this in order to secure hers. And I thought this was so much more fitting with the Mary from the original and we can't really blame her for it because we get a very clear indication that there's not a lot of love between the sisters Elizabeth and Jane accepted. So it doesn't seem like any of her sisters really care about her, so we can't really blame Mary if she doesn't feel this kind of love for her sisters either. And if Mary is this person who is so concerned with rationality and focusing on reason and setting aside the emotions, then 
she is absolutely the kind of person who wouldn't understand why someone wouldn't just marry someone that they don't love in order to guarantee their financial safety. And what is really interesting about this, however, is that she realizes that she is being a hypocrite because even though she would really want her sisters to sacrifice themselves so that she can keep her home, she recognizes that she would never do this for them. She herself isn't willing to take this step and to sacrifice herself. And this shows us that even she isn't as rational as she would want to think of herself as being, which makes that a far more interesting character for me. But this doesn't stop you from sympathizing with Mary, and I actually found myself siding with her a great deal, even when she, everything that she was doing was really not moral. And this is all due to Jennifer Duke's characterization. She has reimagined this character in a way that is interesting and compelling, but without idealizing her in such a way that stops us from having fun with her. And I really liked the way that this book dealt with the question of the entail in the Longbourn property and how it explores how far someone would be willing to go in order to write an injustice that would leave six women practically destitute in order to make a man who is already wealthy and perfectly capable of finding alternative ways, if need be, of supporting himself already, you know, even more wealthy than he already is. And the entail is so central to this novel that for someone like me who is writing on women's relationships to property in Jane Austen's novels, then this was an absolute treat. And as it turns out, Mary is actually willing to go very far in order to secure her home for herself. And I promise you, you will never think of marzipan the same way. But at the same time, I can't really blame her, even as I acknowledge that what she is doing isn't normal and isn't moral. And the reason for this is that this isn't right. So... What she's doing isn't right, but neither is what is happening and being done to these women. There is no justice in someone losing their home simply because they were born a woman and not a man. And even though in Austen's novels, when we think of poverty, we always have to keep in mind that this is very much comparative poverty, it's still very unfair that these women will be impoverished without any chance of improving their circumstances, except through marriage, simply because they had the bad luck of not being men. And I really enjoyed the personal development that Mary goes through. She starts off as someone who wants to think of herself as being rational and conservative in her ideas, but who soon realizes that this way of thinking and acting actually actively works against her. She realizes that these conservative texts that she is reading that encourage women to obey very strict rules of conduct actually are just there to put them in their place and to prevent them from demanding something better for themselves. And the more Mary has to face up to the injustice of her situation, the more she realizes that this kind of philosophy only ever benefits those who are already in power, men, and never someone like her. And as a feminist herself, and as someone who in her novels exposes the failings of a patriarchal status quo that benefits wealthy white men to the detriment of pretty much anyone else, I have no doubt that Jane Austen would have absolutely approved of this retelling of the novel and of this version of Mary. And the ending, and I promise, I promise I won't spoil it, is so fitting for Mary and it's one that concluded the novel so well and that I have no doubt that the readers are going to love it. And all in all, I just can't recommend this book enough. It's smart, funny, well-written, and it came exactly at the right time for me to remind me of how much fun we can have with Austen's books and how much fun we can have finding new ways to show how her legacy is still so relevant to our modern world. 
And this is a beautiful book, as you can see, that is of such good quality and such well made that it actually not only survived my very extensive note taking, but actually looks completely new. And it was published by Jennifer Duke herself. And the cover was actually made by her sister, who is an artist and an actress. So this is very much a labor of love. And so if you enjoy this book, then make sure to let Jennifer Duke know about it because I'm sure that she would really appreciate it. And if you have enjoyed this review, then please consider buying the book in the link in the description below. And this book has just left me with so many questions that I can't wait to ask the author. And so if you too would like to know more about it and about how the author came up with this story, then join us for an interview with her that I will be posting on this channel very soon. So make sure if you like this video to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss that and you don't miss any of my future Austin related content. And until then, stay well and keep reading.